harps come in many sizes. The type that classical musicians play is known as the orchestral or concert harp. It produces more tones than any other stringed instrument. At times magical to behold, the harp has entered folklore as the celestial musical instrument of the gods. The harp is one of the oldest string instruments, originating in the Middle East as early as 3000 BC. Harps began appearing in Europe in the 700s. They initially had a curved pillar, but by 1500, this had evolved into a sturdier straight pillar that could support more tension. As music became more sophisticated, a second row of strings was added, as well as a pitch-raising mechanism enabling the orchestral harp to produce more notes. This harp is a cross between a classical harp and a Celtic harp, with a pillar in the front, sound box in the back, and the neck running across the top. The sides of the sound box are called ribs. They're made from seven millimeter thick pieces of solid poplar. The instrument maker traces a rib-shaped template on the wood, then cuts out the shape using a bandsaw. He clamps them onto his work table, then with a plane, makes them symmetrical. Now he draws three lines across each rib to mark where he'll cut slots. We'll see what those slots are for later on. Next, a notched strip of wood called a lining is glued to the curved side of the rib. The lining enlarges the glueable surface, making it easier to assemble. The notches enable the lining to bend to the curved shape. Now the maker glues on the lining that will connect the straight side of the rib to the front of the sound box. He shaves off some wood with a small plane, then rounds off a corner. He planes the back of the lining as well, removing a corner to flatten it. Trimming the linings reduces the final weight of the instrument. Now the maker cuts off the ends of the linings to be able to slide into place the adjoining parts, the bottom plate and top plate. They're made of Russian plywood, which is a piece of plywood sandwiched between three millimeter thick sheets of birch wood. He glues the top plate into place, then clamps it. He does the same with the bottom plate. The back of the sound box is closed with a piece called the back plate. It's also cut from Russian plywood. He glues it onto the lining, applying pressure with a tight rubber strapping. When the glue dries about an hour later and the strapping comes off, the location of the sound holes are marked. The harp maker constructs the top plate from solid spruce. He lays the pieces down from widest to narrowest and then glues on a reinforcement strip made of solid maple. The strings pass through a strip on the outside and inside. This prevents the tension from rupturing the top plate. He attaches a solid poplar frame to strengthen where the top plate and ribs join. After sanding with fine sandpaper, he coats the sound box in varnish. Those slots on the ribs seen earlier are now used to hold the bracings to prevent the ribs from bowing under the tension of the strings. Using a bandsaw, now the instrument maker cuts the neck from a two centimeter thick board of Russian plywood. He makes a slot for gluing the pillar, also made of Russian plywood. Once the varnish on the neck and pillar are dry, he hammers in pins for the strings. This type of harp has 34 strings. Brass bridge pins space them evenly apart. Steel zither pins adjust the tension for tuning. A wooden guide is used to hammer the pins to a uniform depth. The three finished pieces fit together with dowels and slots, with the joints secured with glue and a long screw through the pillar. 
Strength is critical. This harp has to withstand 360 kilos of string tension. Reaching through the sound holes, the maker threads the strings through the reinforcement strips to the pins outside. These are nylon strings. Harps can also have steel strings. The last step is to tune the harp. All is now ready for the Rhapsody to begin.